Great, thanks very much, Jess. Uh, so I'm Paul Wheatley, I'm Head of Research and Practice at the Digital Preservation Coalition, and I will be your facilitator for this webinar. Um, and just to emphasize, uh, re-emphasize what uh, Jess was saying, please dive in there in the chat box. Um, last week was really lively, we had people contributing links and comments and questions, uh, and that goes for our speakers too. If you want to kind of follow up on what you've just been saying with, with some references to more information, please dive in there. It really adds a lot more to the whole experience. So in this fifth episode of the series, we're going to look at how we can scale software preservation to make it practical and useful in an organizational setting. So as well as examining how we can work to provide the technical capability to make the preservation work for us, we also want to explore some of the organizational challenges in applying uh, and in implementing technologies such as emulation. Our invited speakers all have experience not only of developing digital preservation capabilities, but also of realizing or implementing those capabilities within institutional settings. So this is a great opportunity to tap into some of their expertise. I'm not gonna spend any further time introducing the topic. Uh, as you've already heard me talk about the history of software preservation in episode one and that presentation and indeed our last few episodes have provided a useful foundation for today's discussion. So instead, let's get straight on with introducing our guest speakers today. Uh, first up, we have Maureen Pennock, who is Head of Digital Preservation at the British Library. We also have Klaus Reckett of OpenSLX and Freiburg University. Uh, OpenSLX is a company founded to deliver emulation services, where Klaus is the general manager and technical lead. And last but not least, we have Ewan Cochrane, who is the Digital Preservation Manager at Yale University Library. So I'd like to begin by asking our guests if they could provide a little introduction to the work that they've been doing in this area, and then we'll start to look a little more to the future as we get into the topics that we've set for this webinar. So Maureen, please could you kick things off for us? Right, uh, Julie unmuted. Okay, hi everybody. Um, so I'm gonna start by telling you um, a little bit about two projects in particular that we're working on uh, that are relevant to the subject of the webinar that are helping us to achieve our goals of ultimately being able to preserve our digital collections for the very long term. Um, the first of these is called the Integrated Preservation Suite. Um, and this project encompasses the bulk of our software preservation activities. What we're trying to deliver with the Integrated Preservation Suite project um, is a tool set, if you like, that will allow us to develop um, and implement preservation plans that can mitigate against risks before they manifest so that we can preserve pretty much anything that we have collected in a digital form. Um, there are a number of conceptual components in the integrated preservation suite. One of these is a software repository. Um, at the moment we have over, so we, we started collecting content for the software repository over a year ago. I think we have well over a thousand items in the software repository now. Um, they are linked to a, a software catalogue uh, which describes them with licensing information and linked then to another conceptual component called a, a technical registry or a representation information registry, uh, choose the OIS term. This links to a preservation planning and policy database, but fundamentally and more importantly, a preservation workbench that interfaces between all of these components and our long-term repository that will allow us to query the contents of the registry, pull out relevant software that we need to put preservation plans together, execute them, test them, evaluate them, and then implement them if they're deemed to be successful. So the software repository is a really essential part of this suite. Um, another project that I want to quickly introduce to you as well that's quite relevant is called Flashback. So you might have heard of Flashback. Uh, we've been doing this for a few years now. It started off as a proof of concept project and we're now moving into an implementation phase. And Flashback is our project to uh, rescue, for want of a better word, legacy digital collection content that the library has stored, um, that, that the library acquired on handheld media. So we started acquiring digital content, you know, really in the late 70s, early 80s, and it came in um, on discs, pretty big discs sometimes and we might have acquired it as part of a magazine deposit or a book deposit or maybe publishers just sent it to us because they were sending us a bunch of books and they had these CDs as well so they put them in the box too. 
Um, at the time, this was new content, so of course these discs were duly uh, shelved and stored appropriately with the physical artifacts. And we know now that in this way we had quite a substantial number of um, handheld collection content items acquired. So flashback is retrieving that content from the store, it's imaging it, setting up a process to ingest it into our repository, link to our catalog, and ultimately provide access in the reading rooms using um, an emulated solution. And that's something that we've been working closely uh, with Klaus on over the past few years. So those are our two big, most exciting projects, if I'm quite honest with you, uh, that, that we're working on in the British Library at the moment. Um, and yeah, that's us. Thanks, Maureen. Uh, Ewan, could you uh, tell us a bit about your work at Yale? Sure. <laughs> so, uh, not long after I got here, uh, about five years ago, I noticed that we had an awful lot of born digital content in our general collections at the library. That included things on CD-ROMs and floppy disks and um, all sorts of other handheld media, very similar to what Maureen's been talking about. Um, and I've been working with Klaus and Dirk and others at the University of Freiburg for quite a long time uh, using their uh, emulation as a service software. And I talked to folks here and we decided to implement that um, to enable us to access the content that's on all those disks in our general collections. We also then had to go through and image all of that. Um, but we had that underway uh, and I got invited to do a talk at um, a conference over here. And from there, um, we got connected with some funding agencies and they wanted to support fund us to scale up our work using the emulations as a service software so that others around um, the US and North America and potentially more uh, internationally in the future would be able to uh, participate in using that software and doing it um, in a really simple and um, accessible way. So late last year, we got uh, a, two grants actually, one from the Mellon Foundation, one from the Sloan Foundation, um, but they were combined into a single project in which we're trying to scale up access to uh, emulations of service and also um, pre-configured software environments. So what we're doing with this is we're um, kind of piloting a network of, of nodes that are running emulations of service that are sharing pre-configured computers, uh, pre-configured uh, emulated environments um, between them. Uh, we have a, a draft website up on the Software Preservation Network website because we're collaborating with the software did we just post the same thing? Um, we're collaborating with them on, um, on this project, the Software Preservation Network. Um, so as part of that, what we're doing is, yeah, we're, we're establishing a, a number of nodes that are gonna, uh, with node organizations that are gonna share pre-configured environments between them. At Yale, we've, we've managed to get access to a very large collection of software that we're gonna be pre-configuring, which means installing the software, documenting it, and making it available um, via a link for anyone that's in the, um, the network of nodes. Over time, once uh, as the project progresses, we'll be opening up um, access to this network to anyone that wants to agree to the terms, which should be fairly light. Um, and yeah, I think I'll cut it off there because I'm sure the other questions that will come up will let me um, talk more about this. But um, in general, have a look at that website that um, Jessica and I both shared. And the one other thing I was gonna post, if I can get the link, is here's an example of one of the things from our general collections that we have already pre-configured for use in emulation as a service. It's very boring, but it's the kind of thing we have an awful lot of. So these CDs that have some sort of random app on them that um, otherwise is inaccessible because the software is no longer able to be used. Okay, thanks, Ewan. Um, and uh, Klaus, so you're in a little bit of a different situation, but we're obviously with some quite strong connections to what Maureen and, uh, and Ewan are doing as well. So uh, could you say a bit about your work at uh, OpenSLX for us, please? So I have actually two hats on, on my hat. I'm, I'm a researcher at the University of Freiburg where we have a, came a long way in uh, emulation. Everything started with planets. I think most of you are aware of that. So where Dirk, Randolph and I actually showed that rem remote emulation is feasible. Uh, the follow-up was BWFLA, which focused more on scaling, which is which became more and more crucial. Um, technical organization and workflow. So we showed that 
actually um, emulation is kind of usable also from a technical and organizational standpoint. Then we had another project, uh, Emil. It's a German federal project um, where we had the problem actually to make emulation scale with collections. So how do you work with large collections of 100, 500K items or more? Um, and then luckily we, we collaborated with, with Ewan, but also with, um, with Rhizome, um, where we showed that actually public access is possible with emulation as a service. So Rhizome put on a, a productive um, environment uh, in the cloud and made it accessible worldwide, which was, which was uh, great for us to, to, to show that it's actually feasible to do so. And now we are, we are really, really happy to be um, a partner in, uh, in Easy, uh, making emulation scalable, which brings uh, scaling and emulation to really to another level. So, um, and well, we also try, we also work a bit uh, regarding to emulation, so that's my other hat in, uh, in research, uh, with research data management. Uh, applying emulation to containers and uh, well software environments used uh, in uh, research projects and finally well we founded the uh, open SLX um, as, a, as a company for all the things we cannot do within the university which is mostly produce uh, stable software and uh, support software which is uh, a really distinct task uh, compared to research so that's our big history and what, what we've done so far thanks very much Klaus um, and thanks guys so that uh, really sets a good foundation for us now I think our first question our first main topic for today will kind of build on what we've already talked about a little bit um, so I'd like you all to tell us a little bit more about your goals for scaling up software where you see this work taking us over the coming years um, and how you're looking to uh, achieve those goals um, so uh, Maureen, let's go back to you again, if you could uh, kick us off with that one. <clears throat> okay, so um, scaling up the project. Um, I mean, I think I would talk about the scale in, um, in a few different ways, and I'd probably talk about the scale of the collection rather than the scale of the project in particular, because uh, it's the collection that really drives everything that we do. So when we talk about scalability, we could be talking about the size of the collection that we have, um, but we could also be talking about the range of content types that we're dealing with, and we might even be talking about just the sheer number of formats or different platforms uh, that are represented in the collection. So in terms of size, uh, we have over a petabyte of content in the repository already, and this equates to many millions of different digital items. Uh, these digital items represent a really broad range, actually, of different content types. So for those of you who don't know too much about uh, the British Library's collection, it's, it's pretty diverse. Uh, we collect everything from the UK Web Archive to e-books and e-journals to digital music scores, um, orthographic and topographic sorry, um, materials. We collect uh, digitized content, digitized newspapers, digitized manuscripts, uh, manuscripts pamphlets. Uh, we have a pretty uh, impressive um, set of personal digital archives, born digital, personal digital archives, um, and email collections. We have audio content, moving image content, uh, electoral registers. You know, there's, there's, there's not much, really, that's not in the collection. And all of these different content types represent a quite a, a big range of technology. Um, and platforms, and different generations of technology and platforms. As I mentioned earlier, you know, the collections dating back to the, to the late 70s, early 80s onwards. So we, when we think about scale, we're thinking about scaling up in terms of the diversity of format, the diversity of content types, and the diversity of platforms, as well as the sheer number of items that we're going to have to be able to provide access to. Um, and our goal for, for scaling software preservation and emulation at the library is really just having this IPS infrastructure that I talked about earlier, um, linking to the, the kind of workflows that we're developing in Flashback as well, so that we can generate and implement our preservation plans for all of this different types of content, for, you know, for pretty much everything. Um, the, the scale at which we operate really leads us to think that emulation um, 
is going to be such an important part of our solution if we want to be consistent, if we want to be cost efficient, and if we want to have an infrastructure that we can easily reuse for different content types regardless of what those content types are. Um, and yep, it comes down to IPS really. IPS is going to help us to, uh, to do what we need to do in terms of scaling up for preservation. Thanks, Maureen. So you, you talk particularly about the scale of, uh, in, in terms of the diversity of material. Um, I guess the um, oncoming sort of um, increasing interactivity is also an issue as well. Is that something that, that's, that's driving towards the, uh, looking at software preservation in more detail? Uh, yep, that just helps bolster the argument even more, really. Uh, so we've done some really interesting work recently looking at um, content that is delivered on mobile devices, is designed for delivery on mobile devices, but is quite interactive and web-based interactive narratives, trying to understand the relationships between all of the different characteristics and functionality that's embedded in these objects. And it really just underpins the argument that, that emulation and scalable emulation is a is going to be a strong tool for us going forwards. But that's underpinned as well by some of the work that was done in flashback. And as Ewan mentioned earlier, you know, when you're imaging these disks, these old disks, you come across content that is really so diverse and it does need very particular and, and legacy environments in order for it to be rendered and to become accessible. So we're seeing this need from, from both ends of the spectrum. Okay, thanks, Maureen. Um, I'll pass over to you and next. Okay, so scaling. What um, what we're really trying to achieve with the Easy Project is is a number of different things. But um, what Klaus's team have done that's been so valuable is make it really easy to access emulators and emulated computers via a web browser without having to know an awful lot about um, how to configure the emulators. A lot of the configuration of the emulators and so on is done. Um, by classes team or by the, the pre-configured emulations the service software when you install it. And that's extremely valuable. It's really democratizing access to emulation as a technology. Um, and what we're trying to do with the Easy Project is then take that and um, add m even simplify things even more by um, firstly pre-populating um, this network of nodes with uh, computers that already have software installed and configured on them. Um, that means that a, a user at one of these organizations can just take one of those and, and tweak it however they want to, maybe add another piece of software to it or change a configuration setting or just use it as is and add their content to it or attach some content so that a user can interact with the content via that um, pre-configured software environment. Um, I mean, a simple case for us is we've already pre-configured a, a number of operating systems. So as we're going through and um, configuring those CD-ROM environments, all we need to do is, is install whatever's on the CD and put a link in the startup and then um, save that as a new derivative environment and the users can then just click a link and have the thing load. We don't need to reinstall the operating system every time because it's already there and available. Um, so that's one component of this, the scaling that we're, we're, I'm really excited about. Um, and then once you have a, a set of, um, actually just as an aside, we're really tackling kind of the, the most popular pieces of software and we're really only looking at North American things. I think there's going to be a, a huge long tail of software that everyone else is going to have to put a lot of work into um, taking care of. But we're hoping that the part that we'll, we'll seed into this network will um, uh, really kickstart things and make it so much simpler for people to, uh, to make the case for using emulation, but also um, get value from it. But so on top of that, network of uh, configured environments. I mean, there is a lot of work that Klaus's team will be doing with that to make the sharing of the environments work in the background, to make authentication and security work in the background, and ensure that users can put things in there that'll only stay local to their uh, organization. Um, so there's a lot of structural scaling work that the Klaus's team is doing that's really valuable, that's going to be hopefully invisible to users, but uh, a huge amount of work. But then on top of that, we're adding a, a number of uh, access mechanisms. Um, so as well as installing and configuring all that software, we're documenting it um, so that we know what kind of uh, formats it can, um, it can interact with. And using that, we can then basically develop an API that allows you to say, okay, I've got this file, can you just give it back to me in the appropriate software that maybe was contemporary with that file and was able, and the default format for opening 
things uh, with that software was the format that this file has. So in other words, you send it a file and it renders it for you in the original software. Or you can send it a file and it'll tell you, we've got these environments pre-configured and they are all compatible with it and they're from the same period as that file. Um, in addition to that, we're looking at developing a couple of interfaces, uh, one to one more focused on scientific software and reproducibility use cases, um, and another interface that's focused on uh, virtual reading rooms, um, with the idea being that once we have this infrastructure in place, there's nothing stopping us from also then um, dedicating environments to users for a period of time and limiting how they can interact with that environment so that um, we could add some content to it an environment, provide it to a user for a period of time, and they can interact with it, but they can't necessarily print or copy content out of the environment, or if they do, it needs to be, it could be vetted by staff. That would mean then that um, you have the, the concept of a virtual reading room being made available, and that virtual environment then could be made available only in a physical reading room or online to anyone that's registered, or however um, anyone implementing this wants to do it. And then the fourth, um, Thing we're hoping to scale out is uh, take the work we've been doing with our CD-ROMs and pre-configuring those and share them with anyone else that also has the same CD-ROMs um, so that they don't need to do that configuration themselves, but they could also then potentially contribute any CDs that we haven't um, done that uh, they have locally as well, just so that we get more value from, um, from the work we've done and we can share that, that all that work we've done pre-configuring those with anyone else that already has them. Yeah. Thanks, you, and that's uh, that's fantastic. That's a really long list of uh, of goals that you got there. That's uh, amazing to hear about all that. Um, Klaus, let's bring you in as well. Obviously, you've been behind a lot of the developments that have got us forward to a point at which we can start to realise some of this and start to provide access to content um, using emulation in a, in a way that that hides a lot of this complexity from the user, as you had said. But uh, where where are you going next? Where where are we scaling next? So in the past, we focused mostly on technical bits, like we improved emulation in a, in a technical way that it became more usable. Um, when it comes to scale, scaling access was a, was a huge problem. Previously, you had to configure every environment, every emulator setup one by one, and it did not scale. And, and now we can provide access, I don't know, to I won't say infinite, but a, a huge number of um, of uh, users in parallel uh, using cloud services or um, even in the reading room. So the, the um, access is or scaling access was 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 one huge thing. The other thing is um, as as um, you and and Maureen mentioned, um, scaling with the number of objects was or is still um, a huge. Um, well, challenge uh, because people people come with the object perspective in mind, and what we try to provide is 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 a is a workbench um, or a, a framework um, which avoids recreating the same setup and the same work again. So um, hopefully, this this um, this project will lead uh, to some work sharing. So people show or pro provide some, some, some groundwork um, where, where others or other institutions can tap into and, and use it uh, with their own objects. So they will save a lot of time and a lot of effort um, and will share knowledge. But I think the, the most important problem we, we face so far is um, scaling over time. So um, emulation, is software based, um, so an emulator is kind of a software. So it it seems like a, a paradox a situation, like using contemporary software um, to preserve something uh, in the long run. Um, which because at some point the emulators uh, will become obsolete, um, and, and that is for sure. Uh, or that the emulators we now uh, we we use now uh, will become obsolete, and that is pretty sure. Um, so, so to to do that, we try to reduce the number of setups or technical setups of emulator setups as much as possible, which means having a common shared technical uh, technical stack. Um, and if we so we have a huge number of objects, but only a very small number of, um, of 
technical setups of running these objects. Um, and so we can focus, and the whole community can focus then to, to move this small amount uh, of technical bits in the future on a, on a new uh, technical platform or on a, on a new kind of emulation, um, which we believe right now um, is, can be quite feasible and especially cost effective uh, compared with the number of objects um, these these small numbers of uh, technical environments actually can render thanks class um, so i mean that you've all described some um, really complex and really in-depth uh, work to us there um, our next question looks at really um, how you were able to embark on that work. How did you, how were you able to make the case to actually devote resources to that within the institutions? Um, you're working in the software preservation field, you're um, at the vanguard of that work, I suppose. It's not the run of the mill digital preservation work that you can find elsewhere. Um, so making the case, making the justification within your organization wasn't obviously going to be easy. So how did you go about doing that and can you pass on? Any tips to the rest of us on how to how to do that? Um, let's uh, let's mix things up a little bit. Let's go to Ewan first this time. Okay, um, I'm going to try and be really brief on this one. Uh, the two things would be the the initial work we started at Yale. Um, I, I I started in a new role here, and the first thing I did was was put a lot of time into making the case for getting more resources and building up our capacity here. Um, and when I went to then say, okay, there's, here's this really practical thing I wanna do around those CD-ROMs and floppy disks and our general collections. That was uh, an easy sell by then um, because it wasn't a, a, a lot of resources I was requesting. And um, it was obvious that these things were being lost as well. I use quite a lot of scare tactics, scare tactics often in so much as I'll, I'll show things that are being lost. I've been um, using this research uh, I did with um, Dirk from Freiburg, uh, amongst others, at Archives New Zealand that I just linked to in the um, chat there. I've been using that extensively over the years because there's some really good visual examples of why we need to use software, uh, we need to preserve software to access old content, and that's been a really good one. But then I think um, with the uh, the large project, uh, I mentioned I talked about what I've been doing with the CD-ROMs at Yale at a conference, and it was after that I was approached by one of the funding agencies to, um, to, to work with them on putting together a case for scaling up this work. Um, and so I, I think I just got partly got really lucky, but I also think that the emulations of service software really sells itself. Once you have a few examples in there, um, you can just show how simple it is and how scalable and how effective it is um, to be able to use emulation to uh, access this old software in order to access your old content and make sure it's still running and um, still accessible to future users. I really think it's such a, a good way not just to sell uh, the need for emulation software preservation, but digital preservation as well. Because as I always mention, I've mentioned more and more over the last couple of years, um, digital content, when viewed in the original software, has this kind of digital patina. It really has a look and feel that makes it feel old and seem old, which is something that's really hard to get with digital. Um, and I think using emulation and using the original software to access old content really makes it seem old and makes it easier to sell. Thanks, you. And uh, let's go to Klaus next. Klaus, you're in a little bit of a different situation here, but um, as you and said, uh, I guess after all those years of, of foundational work to make emulation a little bit easier for us all to implement, suddenly you had a, a good case to sell, um, but you've taken quite a big leap um, to start OpenSLX. So could you tell us a bit about a bit about that? Well, it's now time. I mean. It's not just, as I mentioned previously, it's, it's, the technology is mostly there. Um, so we have improved the technology and, con and conceptually also um, emulation as a service such that it became useful and usable, at least we hope that. Um, but emulation is not just a technology, in, especially in context of digital preservation. It, it, it must not be seen as a technology because the, the narrow is too focused. It's, it's, a, it's, more, it's more like a strategy. Um, which which in, involves more than just the, the technology bits. So as such, it needs to be embedded into a greater landscape, um, so that such as it works seamlessly with other strategies or with other tools. Um, so a lot of work we, we will face is to integrate with repositories or uh, with 
with uh, other uh, preservation systems to make it work in uh, in uh, in in a, in a greater context because emulation itself or the emulation strategy is also only one strategy of many strategies out there which need to be combined um, to to a digital preservation strategy if you have a, a complex set of objects um, and the other one the other thing is it needs it needs an ecosystem um, for emulation to to succeed and one important bit and that's why we are so happy to work uh, on on easy because there, it is it has a strong focus on, on on software and software preservation is actually uh, we need software software available um, and with, without the software and the other bits around um, around software preservation um, I think we we won't be uh, successful either in research as uh, emulating like promoting emulation as a strategy and or in in a commercial settings because everyone asks us um, how, how do we want to deal with software so having a combined um, approach uh, also on on uh, software preservation and embedding emulation into a, a more lively ecosystem with, uh, with other components I think is a is, is, is kind of a um, crucial step right now for us. Thanks, Max. And uh, over to Maureen. Maureen, was it was it a tough sell to launch into all this work uh, involving software preservation at the uh, Yeah, to be honest, it wasn't that hard. Um, obviously, our mandate as a national memory institution uh, gives us a little bit of weight for doing these kinds of things. Um, our experience was similar to Ewan when it came to making the case for a preservation solution for content that we acquired on handheld media. I mean, this stuff is obviously at risk. Um, people can see it when you wave a floppy disk at them. You know, they get that uh, relatively quickly. So we started doing that work as proof of concept uh, projects that required absolute minimum additional investment because we already had the staffing in place and through doing the proof of concept we were able to start generating evidence and data um, about data loss and about difficulties in rendering that we could then present to our project sponsors um, and get their support for taking the project on and scaling it up. Um, in terms of the IPS project and making the case for that one, I um, have to be honest and say actually we didn't pitch it as a software preservation project. Uh, we pitched it as a project that would allow us to preserve our digital collections and acquiring and preserving software was one part of that overall strategy. So we put a business case together, which is, is how we usually do things at the library. Um, and the business case for the project just really underlined how this work supported our mission and our mandate as a national library, um, and how it was an enabler for, for other corporate or departmental strategies. Um, again, we weren't really asking for a great deal more money in this project, you know, because we already had the staff in place. We had a dedicated digital preservation team. Uh, we needed relatively few additional resources, but the project was positioned as a uh, as a corporate project within, you know, corporate portfolios. This particular one was about um, enhancing and improving our digital collection management capability. So, getting the project in the right place. Um, and asking for relatively little money and, and selling it in a way that aligned it with your organizational goals was uh, a really important part of the strategy for getting the project in place. Thanks, Maureen. So you're not really doing software preservation, you're doing digital collection preservation, and it just happens to be that some of that is software and some of it depends on software. It's that sort of different perspective almost. It, it is. The, the way we talk about it is that we acquire and we preserve the software in order to preserve our digital collections. So the software isn't acquired as collection content per se, but it allows us to preserve our digital collections. Sure. Um, and that does, um, it sounds a little bit like semantics, but it does make a difference when it comes to how we have to deal with that content. Okay, thanks guys. Um, so we'll move on to our third question. Uh, time is moving on, so uh, we should uh, move on a bit quicker as well. Um, the third question really looks at the, the sort of uh, collaborative perspective um, and asks really why it's important to broaden participation in software 
preservation. And we've kind of already touched on this a little bit, but it would be great if you guys could consider why we need to work together and perhaps what the thing, particular things are that, that we should be working together on um, and, and looking to increase that community participation. Um, let's go to Klaus first. Let's mix things up again. Go ahead, Klaus. Um, well, there are two, two interesting bits to talk about. Uh, first of all, software has some, some interesting properties. Uh, most of the published software was made to scale. So uh, the idea was to develop it once and then sell as many copies as possible and get rich quickly. So that, that was the idea of you know, software, which is actually very good for us, which means that typical software has not been tailored to or customized um, to, to a specific setup. So, it, so it's not necessary that every memory institution actually maintains its own copy um, of, of each software item. So there is a, this, this is a great case uh, for actually sharing um, because it's just off the shelf standard, a, a, a very off the shelf standard product. And so especially um, we, we can share a lot of um, technical, structural um, and the descriptive metadata about, about software. So what, what a certain software is capable of, so like rendering and kind of what, what, what it can render objects or file formats, um, its technical dependencies, which are not available usually in, in, a, in a machine actionable form uh, by default. And um, so this, this is a huge effort to, to make that available, uh, especially for, for a technical product like emulation as a service, which relies on this information to make everything as, as seamless and uh, effortless as possible. And maybe in the future, we can also share, about soft, uh, share information about software um, used in, uh, successfully for this and that uh, use case, which is also kind of an improper, uh, important information for others um, because they know it actually worked in a certain case or with, uh, with a certain use case. And the other point of, uh, of broaden the participation is kind of diversity and specialization. Every institution, especially the, the more specialized institution, um, they have their uh, specific expertise and they, they collect specific types of software we are probably not aware of that it actually exists, um, which is great. So like uh, people from the art domain collect different software than uh, people from the, from the engineering domain. Um, which which might be not on the radar of uh, a general collecting institution like um, a library or an archive. So um, I think this, in including a large uh, and diverse crowd in in uh, in, in this effort, is is, is is great because everyone uh, is a lot about sharing, and there is a lot of. Um, uh, resources that or synergy that that can uh, be created out of the of the sharing. And uh, Maureen, let's go to you next. Uh, yes, so everything that Klaus said, uh, I would uh, I would agree with that. I mean, I actually asked this question of our technical architect who uh, who works on it, a chap called Peter May, and he rather helpfully helpfully sent me back I think a page and a half of bullet points um, and things that we could all be collectively working on uh, together uh, and why it's important to broaden participation in software preservation. I could reel through that list here. It's quite a long one, but. Um, <laughs> Perhaps a better, uh, better and more succinct way to answer this question is just to say that there is still so much that we don't know. There are so many questions that we just don't really have clear answers to that we need to work through. Um, and it's, it, this is not something that is unique to software. You know, we, we were in this position in digital preservation generally 20, 25 years ago. We had so many questions that we wanted to work through. And we, as a community, have really benefited from uh, working together and exchanging knowledge and exchanging experiences. And we have to, to some extent, you know, apply that same model to, uh, to software preservation, but learning by doing at the same time. Um, we just do still though have so many questions as a community about how we preserve software, you know, are there standards that we should be using, how do we describe things, um, how do we document dependencies so that we know we can reuse the software again at a later date, how do we deal with, uh, with, with different types of software. 
Um, do we know enough about how to scope a software collection so that it meets our organisational needs? Do we know enough about the licensing issues that we think are stopping us from preserving software and providing access to software? Um, licensing in particular is, a, is an issue for me that I think we can benefit from working on collectively. Um, as a, as a community and this is something that it's been really great to talk with with Jess about and Software Preservation Network to try and work through some of those some of those issues that um, otherwise just remain this massive big question mark and unknown about what exactly are the licensing issues that are otherwise stopping us. Thanks Maureen and uh, you and so you've already told us quite a bit about the collaborative work that you're doing but uh, do you have anything to add on, uh, on that question? Uh, just to briefly reiterate that um, I think there's a huge long tail of software out there that um, uh, that we're not going to be tackling in the work that we're starting here, but we're going to be hopefully enabling others to, um, to tackle more easily. And that's just really valuable. I mean, the things that come to mind in particular are different internationalization, uh, internationalized versions of, of software applications, but also just all the obscure stuff that a small community like um, used a lot, like Klaus was talking about. Thanks, Ewan. So, um, time's moving on. We're going to run over a little bit so we can um, finish off our four main questions. But um, if anyone out there in the audience has any questions, please start typing them into the chat box and we'll come to you next. Um, in the meantime, we'll just do our, our last question here. So, um, what we want to look at here is perhaps areas perhaps challenges that are on the horizon that you guys aren't immediately looking to tackle with your current work um, but you, uh, it will certainly be important to solve if we're to move forward and meet our preservation goals. Um, what, what are those What are those gaps? What are those outstanding challenges? Um, and which are the ones that worry you the most? So uh, let's go to Maureen first this time. Uh, I don't think there's anything that we've ruled out that we're aware of that we've said, no, we're not going to do that. Um, it's more a case of what are we going to do first and, and what can we reasonably and feasibly leave until later. Uh, we are working on this as a project, but the intention is obviously that at Project End, this becomes a, a business system. It becomes an infrastructure that we use, that we maintain, um, and that we'll need constant working with and updating and addressing new challenges as they arise. So um, yeah, I don't think there's anything that we've purposefully ruled out. Okay, thanks Mo. Uh, let's go to you and next. Um, the things that come to mind for me are we're not working on uh, maintaining or developing new emulators and someone needs to do that. Um, I'm wondering if it's something that the likes of the DPC or Open Preservation Foundation might want to tackle in the future. Um, the, uh, the other thing is we're not explicitly tackling licensing or licensing issues as part of this project, but uh, funded alongside our project was a project uh, led by I believe, the University of Virginia to look into fair use for software and software preservation um, in North America, at least in, in USA. And it looks pretty promising that uh, there's a pretty strong fair use case for doing the kind of work that we're doing. and, and they, this sharing of the pre-configured environments between our, um, our different nodes for our project. And I think I actually, I prepared, there was one other thing I was going to mention. Uh, yeah, so we're not also not, we're kind of scoping the, the software component of our work, mostly to North America at the moment, mainly due to the licensing issue, but there's no reason why in the future, so no reason yet that we've come across that this couldn't be expanded more widely in the future. Uh, and then the other one is, um, we're not looking at how some more commercial use cases might be incorporated into this in the moment. So, for example, if you were a lawyer and you wanted to get one of our, the environments or participate as a node um, in our network and use some of the environments because you need to validate some evidence for a, a court case, uh, we're not really supporting that kind of use case at the moment, but it's something that I'd love to enable in the future because I can see that legal use case becoming a huge one in the future. Thanks, Ewan. And uh, Klaus, do you want to round us off on our last question? Well, there are some, some challenges which we already can see, uh, which are forthcoming. Uh, actually, we are in a very good position um, that we always look back and we have kind of a 10-year gap um, to focus on. So 
we focused on on the CD ROMs and now we, we we slightly move forward. But if we look into the future and also also backwards, um, there's there's one huge challenge we have to face at some point. That's operational knowledge and the changing user interface, uh, user interaction product paradox. Um, they are changing so quickly. So if you try to to work with um, old business software from the 80s or from the 90s, which is DOS-based and very heavy, relies heavily on knowledge about, I don't know, specific key codes you have to enter to, to reach a certain point in, in, in your workflow, that's quite difficult. And um, storing the manuals is, is, is for sure one point, but I think uh, it's not very, it does not scale if you, if you stick to that, to that topic. Um, it does not scale well. So this is something that that is actually probably coming up. And if we if you take a, a closer look to the software, that um, there is another issue coming up for software preservation, is in particular not that much for emulation, but very much for software preservation. Um, software as a concept is dissolving. Um, so um, previously, you went to the shop and bought a box. And there were, were kind of uh, the manual and some some discs or CD-ROM or whatever it was, but it was complete. So so you put some money on the table and and, and you got a box and you went home and that's it and you can store that. Um, now you buy something which is more opaque. It's more blurry. It, there is there are no defined boundaries. You have these in-app purchases uh, where you can extend functionality. It's not. Restricted to apps, it or uh, I, I think Photoshop also has has this feature where you can buy uh, new features which are only available if you're online or um, uh, you can buy them online. So, so the concept of having something which you can preserve uh, uh, is getting much more difficult. And because and and similar, we have this as a service things. We also are an as a service company or uh, setup. Um, so in the future, we will see a lot of complex objects will be generated with as a service um, software product. Um, so if you want to keep these objects alive and if you want to render them in the future, so we also have to think about how to deal with these modern ways of software, um, which is for us now very hard to, to put together into a box. Thanks, Klaus. Um, we've got a question from Brandon. Um, in some ways, it's quite broad. Um, he's asking, uh, so he, he notes that he's, he's got an idea of how things are going to play out in the US. Well, well, tell us how they're going to play out in the US, Brandon, because uh, those guys in Europe would like to hear. Um, but he's asking how things might play out in Europe. So I wonder if Maureen, you might be able to comment a little bit on what the BL's up to. I know there's only so far you can uh, go into the detail of these things, but uh, it's a little bit that you can add for us on that. Right. Uh, yeah. So the licensing I've mentioned already, licensing is a is a pretty big issue for us, and it is um, something that we are trying to do, trying to address as part of the IPS project. Um, actually, what we're trying to do is talk to the vendors and get some vendors on board um, and get them to understand what it is that we're trying to achieve, so that we can work out a way to um, obtain appropriate permissions or licenses from them that uh, we are mutually happy with. So it's, it's about discussion. Uh, we're working with one major software provider in particular and having conversations with them um, and with companies that license their products to, to try and just get them to understand what it is that we need to be able to do. And I'll be honest with you, it's a little bit amorphous. Um, you know, we're, we're trying to describe future scenarios in, in our particular case because we're not, we haven't delivered it yet. It's not working in the reading rooms. What we're trying to do is prepare so that when we do go live with the project, you know, we've got all the licensing sorted out. So it's, um, there's a lot of conversations going backwards and forwards um, and a, a lot of, you know, mentioning of products. Actually, you know, maybe that's not quite what we want. We don't want to buy a new product, um, you know, but we want to understand how we can use archived products or legacy decommissioned um, products that you provided to enable preservation. 
Um, the, the thinking is that if we get uh, one or two big software houses under our belt, it'll ease the way for us to have conversations then with other software providers. And um, so that's the approach that we're taking. Um, I was at an event in Berlin, um, was in Berlin last week for a digital publishing summit um, and actually was asked a question by one of the software houses there um, about how we are preserving software. So I think that what, what that said to me was that actually active engagement with software providers and starting those conversations um, is a really positive way to get the ball rolling. You know, another approach is to ask your legal and your licensing team to sit down and examine all of your end user license agreements that you <laughs> for products that you've previously bought. Um, we don't have the time to be able to do that for the, you know, the many thousands of items that we're going to have to do it for. So yeah, we're taking a slightly different approach. Thanks, Maureen. Um, so we're getting towards five o'clock now. We're already running over a little bit, so we should probably wrap things up there. But we very much like to keep the conversation going. So um, please join us for the following uh, webinars uh, that uh, Jess is going to tell us about in just a moment. And uh, you know where we are. So um, please continue the conversation with us offline and online on Twitter and elsewhere. Um, so at that point, I'll thank our guests. Thank you very much, guys. It's been really fascinating to chat to you about. These are uh, really, really interesting and exciting topics at the forefront of digital preservation. Um, and at that point, I'll hand back to Jess. Thank you so much, Paul. And thank you, Maureen and Ewan and Klaus uh, and to all of our attendees that offered up links or references, um, project web pages for things that they're working on that are related and any questions that you offered up. As I said in the beginning, any comments that we weren't able to address in the course of today's discussion will be posted. Uh, the chat transcripts have been posted from each of the episodes uh, alongside the recorded webinar itself. So again, thank you everyone today. Um, this session was fantastic and it will be posted on both websites, SPIN and DPC, uh, at the end of the week, alongside, as I mentioned, supplementary resources, which will include citations for some of the materials that were referenced in today's discussion. And we'll be sure, as Paul mentioned, to share that link out both via email and Twitter. Um, and the, the conclusion of today's discussion was a perfect segue into what will be sort of the last section of, the, of this round of software preservation webinars. So what we've done is we've rescheduled what was going to be webinar six, which would have been next week. Um, we're going to reschedule that for July, which is the legal possibilities for software preservation. Um, so we can go into greater depth about what some of the legal strategies and tax are for software preservation in different contexts. Um, that is going to be a two part series so that we can go into a little bit of additional detail that will be in July, so a new registration link um, with the description of that two-part mini-series as, as sort of the penultimate uh, completion of our, of our webinar series will be coming out to everyone. We'll explore, as I mentioned, legal challenges associated with preservation, sharing, and reuse of software. Um, and yeah, we'll be looking to perspectives from European and United States legal contexts. So we... Um, we just want to say again, thank you so much to all of you that have attended these five webinars in, in sequence. We'll be sending out a, a, a semi-comprehensive or attempts to be semi-comprehensive survey about what everyone would like to hear more about in terms of future software preservation programming. So please look out for that as well. Thank you for joining us today and we will see you in July. <laughs>